What is a pillar? What is the purpose of a pillar? What does a pillar do? Um, I would say it supports a great structure, like something like that. Perfect. Exactly what it, what it does, Victor. So think of a pillar as supporting the structure of white inferiority, okay? So they can help, help, help you to make sense of it. So the two pillars are the white imagination and the maintenance of white innocence, okay? Write this down. The white imagination and the maintenance of white innocence. Um, if possible, also, if you guys open up the screens, it would really help me out. Um, so let's talk about the white imagination first, okay? One of the clearest manifestations and personifications of the white imagination could be found in Hollywood, right? Think about movies. Think about the ways that um, Black people are portrayed in movies, okay? Um, for me, growing up, in the 90s, we had the phenomenon of like the gangster films, right? You had your um, Boys in the Hood, you had your Minister Societies, et cetera, et cetera. So think about the stereotypes that are portrayed with those images, right? What, is, what are the narratives being told through those type of movies, okay? This is something that's produced through the white imagination, right? Um, another place that the white imagination comes into play is in the aspect of policing, right? And this notion of them being afraid for their lives, right? This is what you always hear when it comes to the situations of George Floyd, when it comes to situations of Tray Trayvon Martin, Philando Castile, et cetera, et cetera. The rationale is always the officers feared for their safety, okay? So this is where the imagination comes into play. Rationally, they have a bulletproof vest, they have handcuffs, they have tasers, um, they have pepper spray, and they have a gun, right? Um, by and large, these individuals are unarmed, right? Sometimes they're women, sometimes they're juveniles, right? But always the narrative of fear is at the center of what's going on and why they're able to act the way that they do, right? So what happens is um, Philando Castile is murdered. They take it to trial, right? They're being tried possibly, and on, on, on very seldom cases, right? They're being tried with things like manslaughter, attempted murder, things of that nature, very seldomly, right? Um, but when it, gets, when it is taken to court, the rationale that always allows them to be free is justifiable homicide, right? That's what happens and that allows the officer who, officers who create murder or who um, conducted murder to be set free, justifiable homicide, right? And what makes the homicide justifiable is the fear that the police officers articulate, right? And everyone in the society can understand and can relate to that fear, right? Although the fear is irrational, it's irrational because the police officers are out, are, are out gunning the person who they're coming into contact with, right? They're out trained in the space of the person, how to deal with these um, scenarios, or they should be better trained, right? Because it's part of their job, right? They have all the tools and tactics to not have to be afraid of these individuals. Furthermore, this is part of your job criteria. Right, that's the equivalent of me saying, I'm afraid to speak to students when my job is to speak to students, right? So the fear becomes irrational, right? But because of the hegemony of the white imagination, the ability to make the white imagination something that's fixed, something that's real, right? Through movies, through stories, through novels, right? Has anybody seen the movie Birth of a Nation? Nobody. Nobody seen the movie Birth of a Nation? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, try to do this real quick. So Birth of a Nation is probably one of the, this country's most widely recognized films, okay? Um, it was like one of the first major motion pictures. Um, the author, not the author, but the, the producer of the film is a, a guy named D.W. Griffin. Griffin. Um, the film was shown in the White House. So essentially the premise of the film 
is the um, post-Civil War Reconstruction era. Um, newly freed Blacks have taken spots in political office, right? Um, due to that, the American society is eroding, right? And the fear of white women being raped becomes proliferated throughout the society, right? And this is due to a Black man. In the film, though, it's a, a white man in blackface, okay? It's not an actual Black character, but they, hide, they have a white man, they put him in blackface, and he chases this woman, this white woman, and she falls off the cliff trying to avoid rape, a rape, right? But due to this act, the Ku Klux, Klan, Ku Klux Klan rises, and that begins to set the rights of the society, set the wrongs of the society right, right? They run the Blacks out of office, and they start to initiate initiate these um, eras of Jim Crow and Black codes. Okay, so this is the premise of the birth of the nation. Again, the country's first real wide recognized um, film. This is went on tour all throughout the United States, and this was shown in the White House. Okay, so think of the um, symbolism of this black man chasing this white woman off the cliff in, a, in his desire to rape her. Right. This creates the imagination of the danger and the, um, the fear that you should have of the black body, right? So this is one component of the white imagination. Um, the other aspect of the Baldwin's pillars of white supremacy is the maintenance of white innocence, right? So it's the need to be innocent at all costs, okay? So um, we talked about justifiable homicide, right? justifiable homicide, the white imagination, which create, which makes this justifiable homicide something that's real. This is coupled with the maintenance of white innocence because the police officer is now deemed innocent, right? So this is how these two ideas intersect, right? Um, the maintenance of white innocence is always looking for the way that we could absolve the guilt of whiteness, right? Um, this is why uh, black people were deemed inhuman because it's, it maintained white folks' innocence, right? Because if we're a Christian country and we're Christian people, but we're going out and enslaving people from Africa, the only way for us to remain innocent is to say that these people aren't human, right? So this becomes the rationale, this becomes the justification for the inhumane acts that people who occupy white bodies are doing they justify it by saying those who are being enslaved are not human, right? So this is how this white, the maintenance of white innocence manifests within our society. So these are the two pillars for James Baldwin that holds up this structure of white inferiority, okay? The maintenance of white innocence and um, the white imagination. So for the text, right, we have the main character, Jesse, um, we start off the text and he's having some difficulties um, performing with his wife, right? Um, but what we also see at play as we kind of get deeper within the text is how anti-Black terrorism, it intersects with the sexualization of the Black body, right? And that's why I brought up the film Birth of a Nation because the main tension of that film was to eliminate black folks raping white women, right? Black men raping white women. So this is also, this tension of the black sexuality or black sexualization is in play within Baldwin's text as well, right? And it's performed in anti-black sentiments. Um, so as Jesse is having his difficulty trying to perform with his wife, he thinks back to how he would used to go to the black side of town, right? And, and, and arrest these um, black women and have them perform sexual favors with him, right? And that makes him think about his prowess as a man, right? Um, think about last week, and we talked about this notion of subversion, right? And we talked about notion, this notion of subversion with the story of the bear, the lion, and the king of the world, right? Subversion is at play in this text as well, right? And they say, uh, when, they inter when they interact with Jesse, the Blacks on the other side of town, right? They always say, yes, sir. And Jesse is kind of attentive to the fact that they're doing this to make him think that they like him, right? But this is a, a tactic of subversion because we know by the, the young Black boy that Jesse meets um, outside of the young Black boy's grandmother's house, right? He, he speaks very plainly to his disdain for Jesse. 
So this yes sir and this um, making yourself, um, hum humiliating yourself or humbling yourself becomes an act of subversion as well, okay? Um, and then on page 232, right? I, I think we have a very great play out of the, um, of the maintenance of white innocence. I'm oh, sorry, actually on page 233, um, towards the bottom of the, so actually let's do this. So a little bit above this second paragraph here towards the middle of the page, it says that um, you had enough, the singing went on. You had enough, his foot leapt out. He had not known it. He was going to, he was going to, and caught the boy flush on the jaw. I'm gonna read that one more time. His foot leapt out. He had not known it, was going to, and caught the foot, caught the boy flush in the jaw, right? So he kicked him in the face, right? But the way that he, that Baldwin articulates, the way that he writes it, right? Like he didn't know what was gonna happen. It was a, um, a chain reaction, it was a reflex, right? This is that maintenance of white innocence. So I'm not gonna say I just kicked him, right it, it, it was a slip you know I, I did it on accident right i i reached for my gun instead of reaching for my taser um who was that that was the brother in oakland um oscar grant right that's what the, the cop said i mistakenly reached for my gun instead of pulling for my taser this is what baldwin's kind of playing with also right his foot slipped out um and then he also goes on to say that, that, you know, Jesse never thought of himself. He thought of himself as a good guy, right? But he never really thought about what it means to be a good person. Think about that. So he thinks of himself as a good person. This is Jesse. But he never thought what it means to be a good person. So how could you think of yourself as a good person when you never not when you never thought about the criteria for being a good person, right? So this allows you to maintain your innocence, right? So I can't, I cannot um, fault myself for my heinous acts because I'm a good person, right? The maintenance of white innocence. Um, Here's a good, on page 237, we have a good example of the white imagination at play. Um, so he says, the explosions rock the night of their tranquil town. Each, ta each time, each man wonders silently if perhaps this time the dynamite had not fallen into the wrong hand. They thought they had knew where all the guns were, but they could not possibly know where every move that was made in a secret place where the darkies lived, right? So there's bombs going off in the town, right? Explosions rock the night. And they wondered if those bombs got in the wrong hands. So essentially what they're wondering is, is it possible that the black folks on, on the black side of town got hold of these bombs, right? And were able to place these bombs on the white side of town. But this, again, this irrational fear, right? Because obviously it's the white folks who have the bombs, right? It's the white folks who are creating these terroristic acts, right? He goes on to say how, you know, if the town was more segregated, like it was in the North, we would just set fire to the black side of the town and call it a day, right? So how kind of irrational is it to think that black folks will be over here trying to steal your bombs and blow you up when you're the ones actually committing the terroristic acts, right? So this imagination at play, this imagination that provokes fear. Um, so does anybody know the historical significance of the term picnic? No. So, the historical significance of the term picnic is at play within the story. What is the, um, what is the main event that the town is going to attend in the story? So what is the event that everyone is piling their cars, they're bringing lunch, right? They told Jesse's father, don't worry about it, man, we got food for you. 
Everybody's going to caravan to this one event. What is that event? It's when they capture the African, the African American man, right? Yeah, it's, it's called a, a lynching, right? Is anybody, is everyone familiar with the term lynching? Is there anyone unfamiliar with the term lynching? I don't know if you're familiar or not, because I can't see your face. I don't know if you're nodding or what. So um, somebody let me know, do I need to explain lynching or are y'all cool with understanding what a lynching is? No, I'm pretty sure we are. <laughs> okay. Um, so the definition of a picnic, right, is essentially the lynching. You would pick a nigga and hang him, right? This is essentially by the by definition. This is what the historicity of a lynching is, right? And this is what Baldwin's talking about within the text. Also, be attentive to the fact that the entire town, right, went out to attend these picnics. It was as if it was a sporting event, right? Also, it's a it's heritage being passed down, right? Jesse's dad picks him up and puts him on his shoulders, right? To make sure that he could see the events take place. Um, Jesse says he's never felt more love for his father within that day, right? So there is this tradition that's being passed from generation to generation. He talks about how his mother was never more beautiful than when he looked at her on that day, right? And then this notion that um, whatever the fire didn't consume, the people consumed, right? And he says that they took their body parts home like souvenirs. Let me see if I can read that. And this is actually, a, um, this is historical, right? They would actually um, take the body parts home and they would place them on postcards and send them out. Um, oftentimes when homes were being sold in the South, they would um, find body parts from people who were lynched, right? So this is historical. Um, uh, then Jesse screamed. The crowd and the crowd screamed as the knife flashed, first up, then down, cutting the dreadful thing away, and blood came roaring down. Then the crowd rushed forward, tearing at the body with their hands, with knives, with rocks, with stones, howling and cursing. Right? So they're taking the body apart to get their souvenir, right? So this is kind of ingrained in the historic fabric of this culture right, of this society, of this country. Um, also, has anybody heard of the term epigenetics? No? Yes, kind of, maybe. Wait, uh, what word? Epigenetics. Epigenetics. No, no. So epigenetics is how, um, it's this, okay, has anybody heard of the book Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome? by Joy DeGru Tyson. Um, so this is a book that studies epigenetics. And the thesis of the book is that trauma gets passed down from one generation to the next, right? So the trauma that your grandfather or your grandmother went through was passed down to your mother and your mother passed that trauma down to you. Any trauma that your parents went through in, the, in your genetic, in your DNA, in your genetic makeup, that trauma is also being transferred down to you, right? Oftentimes, when epigenetics is being studied, it's about, particularly in the post-traumatic slave disorder book, right? It's about how enslavement experience are being trans transferred from generation to generation and is impacting African people of today's society, okay? That's the thesis of the book. But also a component of the book is how epigenetics is also at play within people who own slaves, okay? and people who did things that are articulated within going to meet the man, like castration and like lynching and things of that nature, right? So when you're thinking about 
how to navigate and deal with the racial tensions in this country, you cannot separate histories, right? This idea that these things were so long ago is a false, is a misnomer, right? If epi things like epigenetics are to be true, because the same genetic and DNA that is in these people who are doing things like this and who are suffering things like this continue to be passed down from generation to generation, right? So when we talk about coming to notions like a post-race society, as they say we were under the Obama era, right? And you talk about doing things like diversity and inclusion work, right? How do you reconcile things like what Baldwin wrote about within this book when thinking about coming to a post in an equitable society, right? It, you, you cannot separate the two. So I'll put my um, lecture on hold. We'll jump into our fishbowl. Um, is there any volunteers for the fishbowl? All right, so if there's no volunteers, then I'm gonna um, call at random. Um, Carla, have you fishbowled already? No, I have not. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, Gabriella, have you fishbowled already? Yeah, I have. Have you did it one time or two times? Um, I don't remember actually. I can uh, go again today. Okay. So, uh, this will be your last one for the semester, then, Gabriella. Okay. Okay. Uh, John, have you fishbowled? I fishbowled once. Once. Do you want to go again, or do you want to use your pass? Uh, I'll go. I kind of. I really don't understand. Like, I was kind of confused, but I'll go. But check it out, bro. You can even pose a question. So think about what you wrote as a question in your um journal, and that's a sufficient fishbowl too. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, bet. Um. So real quick though, before we jump into the fishbowl, because again, I, um, I I feel detached. How did y'all feel in general about the reading? Like, what, what are your thoughts? Well, honestly, for me, I was kind of confused at first because since I didn't have like, I went into the reading not really knowing about it. So I felt like I was just thrown right in the middle. But as I kept reading, you know, I was able to learn more about what it was about. But I mean, towards the end, like right at the end, I guess I got the actual, what the point of the passage was or the reading. Okay. Yeah, he, he um, it's a very good point. He kind of just drops you into some shit and you're trying to figure out what you're reading, right? And it kind of evolves and unfolds and reveals itself. All right, Ben, so let's jump into our fishbowl. Um, if anybody wants to start, it's on you. So either Gabriella, Carla, or John. I'm pulling up my journal. Give me one minute. Or I'm still trying to figure out the, my question. That's why. Sorry. All right. Also, you guys could talk about what was discussed in your um, breakout rooms. So was the um, storytelling method effective for you? And what stood out most for you in Baldwin's writing? It's also on the table. Um, honestly, I, I was just kind of confused because uh, I'm not used to like, there's kind of like a, a weird uh, accent or like tone. I don't know how to explain it, but like it, it's, it's like throwing me off and I can't really like understand it. Like, I don't know, it's just something about it that really throws me off. When, when did you read the text, John? Like what day of the week? Uh, I think I read it uh, like three, four days ago, maybe. Okay. Um, is your journal with you? No, my, uh, something happened with my journal, but I'll, I'll tell you about that later. All right, for sure. Um, so what, how can I help you understand the story better? Like what, what question could you ask me that, that would give you greater understanding? Um, 
Let me think. Like so, I don't know, because I'm trying. I'm trying to just remember what I like. What I remember. Yeah. So I'm um, trying to help kind of jog your memory a little bit. So we know that the main character's name is Jesse. He's a sheriff in a small southern town, right? Um, the story at, opens up with his wife asking him, "Well, what's wrong?" Right? And he talks about how the black folks on the side on the other side of town are causing like a tension within the town, right? And as he's laying up at night, he's thinking about the past. He kind of goes back into this memory that's sparked by a, a song, by a Negro spiritual, right? And this kind of jogs his memory to an incident that he had with his father, where his father takes him to his first picnic, right? So this is kind of the premise of the, of the reading. So I don't know if that helps jog your memory, but I mean, I, any, if I tell you any more, I'm telling you the whole story. Um, also, John, you don't even have to think about the story yourself. Think about stories in general, right? Not the story that you just read, but stories as a whole. Do you like stories? If so, why do you like stories, right? And that could be for anybody in the fishbowl. Well, in my opinion, I I kind of felt like bad with um what you mentioned about the leeching and about the picnics and how people like kind of did that like uh, like how people enjoyed to do that and got like the body parts. I feel like that was very sad and like it was very emotional because that's like really messed up, you know. Like if someone's hits a human and like they're just cutting him up and taking it as a souvenir. I don't know. I just felt like it was really really emotional I wouldn't like that or to see that Dude. so with, with that being said Carla um what does it say for people who view that as um a source of entertainment because essentially that's what was taking place right they, they were entertained by what they were witnessing yeah can you repeat that one more time please so you talked about how much like that disturbed you right yeah um, it was uncomfortable yeah it's very uncomfortable so what does it say for a people who are finding this as a source of entertainment i feel like it's saying they're disrespectful or they really don't care about like what other people are feeling or like especially that person you know that's getting leached up and cut into pieces yeah the lack of humanity i would i would call it right there we go yes yeah. that's that's good wording yeah uh gabriella you want to chime in um yes i was just gonna say that um i think a lot of that is relevant today like how you were saying that um because a lot of people would try to say like slavery was so long ago it doesn't like impact today and I think a lot of that is still relevant today because of like the sexualization of black women is very prevalent today, mm -hmm. as well as um, just in general, how they how the media views black men as almost still subhuman, like in a way. And also just like white um, innocence is very prevalent, especially like in the judicial system. When like a white person commits a crime, even if he's like 19, they're like, oh, he's a young kid with promise where areas like a black kid could be like 15 and he's like a, an adult who knew what he was doing. Yeah. Oh. Very good point, Gabriella, thank you. Um, let me ask you guys a question and pose a question because Gabriella made me think about something. How, I'm trying to think about where to phrase this. How recent do you think a lynching had took place? Like how, how long ago in America, American history was the most recent lynching? throughout decades, right? The 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the 80s, the 90s. How, how old do you think the most recent lynching is? I think I saw, um, weren't there like two last year actually? Yeah, yep. in California, right? Yeah. Yeah, so 
this notion that this is a something that's took in, took place a long time ago, and this notion that this is something that only took place in the South is a misnomer. It's a false notion, right? Like as recent as last year, and right. So Palmdale, the Palmdale area, right, is where one of the multiple ones that happened last year um, took place, right? So this is not too far removed from our now, right? I think also what's at play here is James Baldwin has an uncanny ability to not only talk about how this institution of white inferiority, it negatively impacts black folks, right? But he talks about how it impacts negatively white folks as well, right? Because if you, if you read closely to what's taking place in the story, Jesse's having a breakdown, right? What's going on in this town, the, um, the rallying, the, I believe they're rallying, rallying around voter registration, right? That is, is giving him, a, a, it's, it's affecting him physically, right? To the point that he can't sleep, he can't perform with his wife, right? So he has to go back to a time to where we had this situation under control, right? To where if there was a problem with somebody who was black, all we had to do was engage in a picnic and that solves the problem, right? So this is what Baldwin is really talking about. And through him not focusing, yeah, of course, we're, we're, we're dealing with how um, the black body is being impacted by that, right? Because the man on the being hung up is a black man, right? So that's there, but the protagonist of the story is Jesse, right? And really if Baldwin wanted to tell a story about how the, the institution or the, the practice of lynching affects black folks, right? He could have told the story with the protagonist being the, the man who was strung up, right? But he chose to make a story about the, the sheriff and the way that the sheriff can't sleep and, and can't perform his normal duties because of how the dissension in the town is grown, right? So when you talk about method, this is another thing that Baldwin does very well. Um, John, did you want to throw something in or, or are you good for the day? I know you said your internet was broken, breaking up. Yeah, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you, man. Yeah, I was trying to talk, but then like my it said unstable. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, like um, was it? like Carla said, yeah, that it, it made me feel uneasy too. Even though like I've like read a lot about history in high school, like and we have like seen a lot of videos and documentaries about that. Uh, it's even though it's still reading it, it still made me uneasy, like like it did for her. And I think too, another thing um, that adds to the uneasiness, he's very descriptive, right? Like he, he doesn't really leave too much to your imagination, right? Like he, he gets to the very details, even that little passage that I read about the knife and the cutting, right? He's very descriptive about that. He could have wrote that in a different way to where you just have to, you kind of know what's going on, but he has a good way of placing you in that moment by explaining very small details. Um, so let's do this. Let's shift our conversation for the last 15 minutes. You don't have to deal with what was being talked about, but I, I want you to think about how what was being talked about was talked about. So think about the, um, the first question for your breakout groups. Um, what stood out to you the most in the writing? Now, uh, preferably I can hear from somebody who we haven't heard from today. Yasmin, what stood out to you most in the writing? To me, well, it's kind of similar to what you were mentioning. To me, what stood out to me was how, like, well, kind of the same thing you mentioned, like, um, um, he used James, which is a white person and a police officer, as, like, it gave us his perspective on things instead of, like, an African-American who, like, dealt with it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what stood out to me the most. I just found it interesting because usually when I watch, when I read stories or watch documentaries, it gives us a perspective of the African-American and what they deal with on a like, day-to-day basis. And this time we flipped it around, but they were still able to capture, like, I guess, the same idea of what they went to, what they went through. Yeah. What African-Americans went through. Do you think, Yasmin, so with him kind of flipping it, right, do you think that, 
I mean, obviously it accomplishes the same thing, right? But what do you think for you, right? What was significant about being having the to story told from that other lane, opposed to it being the normal way that you hear about the story? Well, I guess I just found it like interesting because it was something new to me. Mm -hmm. I've never really like, yeah, I've, I was never given the perspective. And I guess it has to do, it also has to do with the fact that it was like, you mentioned brutally honest. It was very honest on what like, um, I guess James, thoughts were jesse's thoughts yeah james oh, james, jesse, is the, james is the author jesse is the um the protagonist yeah, yeah. Jesse. yeah. i think you, you put it well it, it's brutally honest right and it really gets to the to the essence of the brutality it's a good point um anybody else uh yeah i'll go uh, kind of adding to what yasmin said um yeah how the james baldwin gives the perspective of the white side too but he showed that they also had fear towards African Americans, that it wasn't fear flowing one way of African Americans fearing the white Americans. It was it was going both because in that I forgot where, but I just remembered it, where he's beating the African American in prison and he keeps telling him to tell the people outside to stop singing, but he doesn't he doesn't give in to the beating, like no matter how hard he hits him and everything, like he refuses to go with it. And then I think he mentioned that he that Jesse realizes that this guy, he's, you know, he's not normal. Like he's gonna stand by what he does or what he believes, no matter how hard he gets hit and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's a good point. And so for me, Victor, that fear that you're attentive to, that's why it's hard for me to call it a system of white supremacy, right? Because if you're really the superior race, if you want, if there's such a thing, right? what are you afraid of, right? You wouldn't have to create all these systems in place to keep you elevated, right? You're doing those things because you are afraid, right? Um, yeah, that's, that, that's why this notion of the white imagination is so powerful because it speaks to the fear that really is residing within the way they even think about the possibilities of the speculative, right? So that, that's a very good point, Victor. Um, what did you guys think about his friend Otis? He kept when he was when he flashes back to him being a kid, right? He keeps asking, "Where's Otis?" Did anybody? What did What did you guys think about Otis? Nobody picked up on Otis. So on the bottom of page 4243, he says um, he had grown uh, he had grown accustomed for the solutions of such mysteries to go to Otis. So there's something going on, right? He has a question. So he doesn't feel comfortable going to his parents. So normally he would go to Otis, right? He felt that Otis knew everything. But he could not ask Otis about this. Anyway, he had not seen Otis for two days. He had not seen a black face anywhere for more than two days. And he now realized as they began chugging up the long hill, which eventually led to Harkness, that there were no black faces on the road this morning, no black people anywhere, right? So there's two things at play, right? He has a question that normally he would go to ask Otis about. Right, but he hasn't seen Otis in two days. Then he comes to the realization that he hasn't seen any black faces in the town for two days, right? But to me, Otis is, is a point of analysis because what does it say for this white boy, Jesse, right? This little white child, Jesse, um, when he has these type of questions, he goes to his, dealing with race, right? When he has these type of racial questions, he goes to his black friend, Otis. What is that? What is the, what does that impl imply? What is the implications of that? Think about that. I'll be back in two seconds.
So what are the implications of Otis? Anybody have an answer or a thought? No right or wrong, just what do you think? What does it mean that when Jesse has questions about racial dynamics of his town, he has to go to his black friend Otis to get the answer? I would say that Jesse is still like, at that point he's still an innocent child. Like he doesn't know the hate about the African-Americans and the white Americans. Whereas Otis, if he's African-American, his parents would have told him like, be cautious of like the white people because they don't like us. Victor, what'd you eat today, bro? What would you have, what'd you have for breakfast or lunch, man? Cause you, you, you on today, man. Um, you're absolutely right, right? Due to survival, Otis has been forced to be aware of these things, right? Otis knows on days like the day that Jesse is describing to keep his ass in the house because his parents had told him these things for Otis to survive, right? Whereas Jesse, he's able to be oblivious to some of these things because his life is not on the line, right? And where you see this play out, there's this book that I had to read um, for my education class on race and it's called The First R. And the thesis of this book is about how, it's a case study um, of kindergartens and first grade students, I, I believe in Ohio, and they're studying how these students practice race. And essentially what the premise is, is that all these children from kindergarten through first grade, they understand and they perform race at even that young of an age. And they talk about how when, act, act, like things happen that are racist, right? They always call the parents in and the parents always respond with, well, they didn't learn that from our house. They should have, they must have picked this up at school, right? This is always the conversation that, that plays. And what the author is arguing is that they earn, they learn these behaviors from society, right? If you watch TV in a racist society, TV will be racist, right? If you go to school in a racist society, the school is gonna exhibit elements of racism, right? So this is exactly what Victor's talking about. And it also says in the book, right, that the black students and students who are marginalized, they are more aware of racial dynamics because their parents are forced to tell them about it for their survival. Whereas um, students who are white or perform whiteness, right? They are oblivious to this because how the parents who perform whiteness always respond, well, we don't even talk about race in, the, in our house. That's not even a thing that's brought up, right? So due to the fact that it's not brought up and it's not talked about, they don't know how to deal with it in a, in a way that could be constructive. Does that make sense, right? So this is what Victor's saying. So Jesse does not know about these things because he has the comfort and he has the luxury and he has the privilege not to know. But Otis has to know about these things because him not knowing could mean his life being taken, right? Him not knowing could be, could mean he's that man up getting, experiencing the picnic, right? So this is the differences and this is what the subtleties that James Baldwin writes within this story. Um, one last comment and we'll call it a day. Jasper or Dwayne, why don't you guys close it out for us? We haven't heard from y'all today. I would also say that I don't remember too much from the reading. Um, it was kind of hard to dissect for some reason. So I'm gonna revisit it and um, add more onto my journal. But I thought that it was very interesting, like the analysis of it, the way that you explained it. And um, definitely seems like an interesting story for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. This is what we're gonna do. Give me, give me one second. I'm gonna just, we'll talk about our readings for next week. We'll call it a night. I'll call it a day. Excuse me. Um, Uh, you know, my fault. I, ha I haven't posted that reading up yet. So I'm going to pull an audible. Um, we were supposed to read, um, I'll, sh I'll show you. 
Um, we're supposed to read Zorno Hurston's of, um, sorry, not Zorno, Tony Morrison's Playing in the Dark, but we're gonna, I'm gonna switch that out. And actually what we'll read is another work from James Baldwin. This one is not like the one you guys just read. Um, actually what we'll read is The Fire Next Time. Um, the essay that was talked about in the video that we watched at the beginning of class. Um, I'll post that to the Google Classroom site today and then I'll email you guys um, the reading by Thursday, so that way you'll have that. So don't look and don't look for the article to be up until tomorrow. Um, and then I'll also email that to you guys by Thursday. Um, it's James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with Baldwin for one more week. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, after next week is spring break, correct? Does anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, we'll do Baldwin for one more week. Uh, we'll have spring break. We'll come back. We'll do our midterm review. And then um, the following week will be our midterm, okay? Um, is there any other questions anyone has for me? All right. You guys have a good week, and I will see you next Monday. Peace. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Carla, John, Sergio, you, you guys have questions? No, I'm good. Sorry. Uh, Sergio, oh, I was going to talk to you about my, my journal. Okay. Um, Sergio, would you mind hanging out for me for a second? I just want to check in with you because I know it's your uh, first day. Um, yeah, what's, what's going on, John? So my my journal actually got torn up. Like, I don't, I don't want to sound like stupid, you feel me? But like my dog, like, it literally like tore up my notebook. The dog ate your homework excuse. Okay. Yeah, um, I, didn't, I didn't want to say that during class. Yeah, then. yeah, no, that's all good, bro. But <laughs> a couple of things. Um, one, you don't have to turn the journal in for another two weeks. So you have some time. Because um, in another thing too, John, you would have to uh, email me the journal. So I don't know if you were planning to take a picture and sending me a picture of the journal or retyping everything out but you would have to get it to me in electronic format you know what i mean because i can't yeah, I, I was gonna give you a picture okay um yeah bro you gonna have to i don't i don't know if you're gonna um have to rewrite the journals you know what i mean because I, I have to be able to see something i have to read the journals you know um mm -hmm. i i wouldn't um but i'm trying to think bro I don't want you to have to go back and read it all, everything all over again, but I, I'm gonna need the journal entries, bro. Like I, I don't, I don't know how else to uh, to think about that or to put that. Even yeah. if, if you, even if you go back and do four bullet points, right? Like sentence for each bullet. I'm I'm cool with that, but it, it got to be something, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. And then do this too, bro. Uh, probably would be the easiest thing to do. Just to be honest with you, I would go back look at the course lectures that are posted on Google Classroom, take down some notes, and then get you three bullet points and that'll be your journal entry. And that way you don't have to read through the book, the material again, you know? Yeah, yeah. That makes sense? I'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah, that sounds smart. And then um, if it just and if anything, just shoot me an email and we can kind of brainstorm some more, but I'm, I'm gonna need something. That's why I don't assign them once a week. I give you guys like the time to, to you know, do them. Yeah, I feel it. All right. Thank you, though. I appreciate right. it. Let me know if you need anything. All right. Have a good day. All right, man. Sergio. Oh, yeah. I just had a, a, a couple questions. Okay. So, basically, um, our journals aren't due today. It's due later, right? Yeah, they're due on the midterm. So normally when people, well, actually for you even too, I'm not gonna, you know, like I said, I won't hold you accountable for the ones you miss. But so for the reading for today, um, that should be in your journal. And then the reading for next week, that should be in your journal. And then you'll turn it into me when you, when everyone else turns in their midterm. Okay. Yeah. And what's our reading for next week again? Um, it's gonna be James Baldwin, the same author, but it's gonna be an essay entitled The Fire Next Time. Um, I haven't posted it to the Google Classroom site yet. Um, I'll do that now, um, but I'm also going to email you guys the reading on Thursday, so that way you'll have okay. it. Okay, thank you. All right, I got everything. 
Um, did you, are you getting emails from me on a regular? Like, um, did you get an email from me this morning? No, no? I, don't, I don't think so. Okay, so yeah. So that means you're not on our list. Okay. Um, do me a favor, one more time, man. Just put your email in the chat real quick. Whatever one you would prefer, your preferred email address. And then I'm gonna uh, make sure you start getting our email. All right. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna put your name on the Google um, Classroom, not the Google Classroom, on our class email list, and you should start receiving all of our emails to this email address here. All right. Any other questions, man? Well, that should be it. All right, bro. Have a good one. Thank you.